Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Future Construct podcast. I am your host, Amy Peck, and this is our special edition series with Shadow Ventures. And I have my wonderful, esteemed co-host with me, KP Ready. Hi, KP. Hey, how's it going? Our, it's all great today. And But what's even better is we have two wonderful guests, but we're starting with the wonderful Sarah Maffey, who is the head of corporate strategy and business development at Local Logic. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for having me. So let's dive right in. Tell us how, I want to hear first about Local Logic and how you started working with them, but then we're going to go way back into the time machine and and (laughs) understand your your journey into this industry. Awesome. Okay. Well, Local Logic uh, is a prop tech company. We use data to quantify everything outside the four walls of an asset. So We're looking at different forms of transportation, access to amenities and services, and uh, even using data to quantify things that you might think of as being a little more subjective, like the vibrancy of a neighborhood. And how did I find out about Local Logic? Well, KP knows this very well. Um, (laughs) I was at Transwestern where I was on the board and uh, working on repositioning commercial assets. And Shadow had reached out to me while Local Logic was raising their Series A to take a look. Um, at the platform. And I was just, I I, I need to think of a better way of describing this, but I just became pretty obsessed with local logic and what they were, what they were doing and what they had set out to accomplish. And um, when I had the chance to join, that's, that's how I came to join local logic. Now, was this always your path kind of in this tech space or did you get there circuitously? Uh, circuitously is definitely a great way of describing it. I, I think, um, you know, when I was in college, my current job didn't even exist. So it wasn't like something that I could grow up thinking, Ooh, someday I'm going to work in prop tech. Um, I really thought that I was going to maybe be an architect or maybe go into real estate development. I studied architecture and urban design at NYU and, uh, ended up working in construction management for a while. Um, went to go get my MBA because I thought, well, this will help me make the transition into uh, real estate development. And uh, shortly after getting there, the whole market kind of crashed and I, I made another pivot, um, went into economic development, which I always think of as sort of being the public side of real estate development and really developed a huge network around the country uh, with different municipalities and states. And that helped me eventually make the transition into Uh, commercial real estate, where I was working on site selection at Cushman. Um, And so it kind of just is, it's always been this evolving thing, but it's always really focused on the built environment and thinking about place and location. So, um, you know, when I was at Transwestern working on um, basically suggesting these ideas for major assets, and, and, and it involves a lot of investment. And I think that a lot of times people are making decisions based on gut feel and my clients were just not accepting that as much anymore. And when I saw local logic and I saw the ability to use data to actually think about the whole area around the asset, which traditionally is something that people are kind of informing based on their personal experience, it really, the the value of it just really struck me. And it was something that I knew that I could use immediately in my day-to-day job. So um, it made the transition really easy for me. to, to join local logic. I don't know, KP. I think that I think I think Sarah's a, an entrepreneur at heart. <laughs> I am. I am definitely. <laughs> How did you two meet? Uh, my wife and Sarah are friends. So that's how we met. Well, so my, my wife's like, what, yeah. what are you doing recruiting all my friends? Like, I'm like <laughs> eventually everyone works for me. My, my wife used to work for me too. So <laughs> eventually. Eventually. It's been wonderful. <laughs> Wow, I mar- I married the boss too, but you know, that's another that's a very that's another that's a rabbit hole we don't want to go down. <laughs> Sometimes it works, it clearly it's working. <laughs> so I, you know, I'm I I I'm very interested. And now that you're you're you know talking about this, I'm thinking, wow, like I think now I'm gonna become obsessed with this too. So tell me some of the data points, like what are the things that are important to mm-hmm. consider or, you know on everything around the asset? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, so many, and it really, I mean, it could happen at any scale of decision-making around real estate, right? Like it could be 
making a decision about where your home's going to be, or it could be making a decision about where to build a massive new asset. You're kind of considering all of the same things because at the core of it, you're thinking about the human experience and what do people need out of a certain location. So I think that um, our scores are, are really asset agnostic in that way. Um, and I think that at the core of it, it's like, how am I gonna get to this location? How accessible is it to other things that I might need? Um, you know, access to restaurants, grocery stores, bars, like it doesn't matter if it's an office or your home, it's, you kind of need all the same things. Charging stations for your Tesla. Sure. Parking in general um, is something that's important depending on the market. So I think it is market, you know, specific in some cases or, or nuanced, you know, depending on the market, but ultimately, you know, what people are looking for kind of remains the same across asset types. You think, you know, one of the things I've always said is like, when you, when you look at industries that are hev- heavily driven by consultants, like mm. site selection consultants, I've been there. Like, this is like their worst nightmare, right? A little bit like they like the control. They like to control the narrative. Like I was meeting with someone from Frisco, Texas one time, their mm. head of economic development. And man, you would think like everybody should be at Fris- in Frisco, Texas. And it was just one of these things. And where, they kind of are, right? Right. <laughs> so like a they, good job. <laughs> right. They figured it out, right? So, yeah. but, you know, there's all these like middle people that are consultants or whatever. Like, how are they taken to this idea, you know, we always joke around that Expedia's first market was actually providing a platform for travel agents. It was like a Trojan horse, right? And then eventually mm-hmm. they said, oh, we'll just take all your customers. You're not needed anymore. Like how, what kind of resistance are you seeing around like the, the consultants that make a living trying to get this data together? Um, I think that we're, we're not yet at a point in adoption where they've started to worry perhaps as they should, but I have actually seen, um, I don't know if you're familiar with global location strategies. They're a, they're a major sort of site selection firm that isn't necessarily associated with a specific market um, or, or a real estate firm, but they work on pretty major manufacturing projects, for example, and they've actually developed their own platform where they're bringing in all these different data sources because they see that as the future of the industry, which I'm really impressed by. Um, I think you know, uh, an economic development organization like Frisco, I think that certain markets are starting to see that pushback from companies. It's the same thing where whether you're talking to your tenant rep broker or the the city that you might be considering locating in, you don't really want to rely on just their opinion about the location because everyone has their own context for that, right? Like I might be coming from San Francisco or New York and have a totally different idea of what access to good restaurants means um, or schools. So I think that there is this just over overarching push to use data uh, as the backbone for what you're suggesting in these kinds yeah. of conversations. How do you think like, <clears throat> so what, you know, every day, is everybody going back to the office? Or are we not going like, and my point is like, whatever, right? Like it is what it is, right? That doesn't yeah. matter. Um, but it seems like if you're a real estate asset owner, like you're, you're almost now in this, like my, my view of, the, of, of how things are going is like leases are going to become shorter. People want flexibility, which means it's not like, oh, I make a decision for my headquarters and that's what it is for the next 10 years. Like, so how do like, I've got to think people are thinking about how do I continually reposition and it's kind of like monitoring your credit score, right? Like, it's like, mm-hmm. how is this market changing on a real-time basis? And how should I foresee that maybe it's shifting from office to multi, like those shifts that happen? Are you, are you starting to people think, getting people, are they starting to think like that far along into the future? Oh, there's so many different ways to approach this. I mean, I think that there, there was already starting to become a shift towards demand for shorter term leases, you know, before all of this started happening. I think it's kind of uh, unrealistic, especially right now when things are shifting so quickly to say, oh yeah, I want to lock in space for the next seven to 10 years. And I know this is exactly how much I'm going to need and how I'm going to use it. Um, It just doesn't fit how business works right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Or how it has for a while. I think that I'm hopeful that especially if you do own large assets, maybe maybe this is also sort of starting to be 
part of that conversation around ESG in some way or like community involvement because I think historically it was like, okay, I have this massive asset. It is what it is. The location is set. It's not something I can change. But with all these different dynamics shifting in submarkets, maybe you do have the ability to start to shape what surrounds you. Maybe you can start to advocate or help uh, fund a park or, you know, bring in other restaurants or maybe make, make the base of your building a little bit more mixed use and open to the community around it. I think there's a lot of different things that can happen in terms of asset strategy right now that help protect that leasing ability in the future. But thing, things definitely need to get more flexible and community focused, I think. Yeah. And so we're going we're gonna to take a quick break and hear from our sponsors. But I do want to come back and, and talk about this a little bit more because there's something I think really interesting here about now space starting to actually actively inform what's around it instead of just leveraging the data, but like leveraging the data and then how do, how do we improve? Uh, but sponsors first, we'll be right back. And we are back with Sarah Maffey from Local Logic, and I, I yeah, I want to go back to that notion of of maybe you know proactively impacting your surroundings. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe what the opportunity is? Mm-hmm. I think that there's an opportunity to just understand what's happening and what's changing in your surroundings. So we've been collecting data on our location scores. Uh, for over five years now. And I think that that's where we're going in terms of product development is really unveiling our historic scores. How has this neighborhood, how has this city changed over time? And then from there, using machine learning to actually make predictions about how neighborhoods and cities are going to change. So, you know, I think um, you think about like a developer like Jamestown, where they're doing these transformative um, asset repositionings. And it's like, how, what is the impact of something like a Ponce City Market in Atlanta on the surrounding community? What has it added? Um, and by, it, by being able to actually use data to track the changes, um, you can start to tell that story. It also is useful in situations where you're looking at trying to create equity. You know, um, if I build here, do, do the residents potentially have access to the grocery stores and to the uh, transit or services that they need uh, to make it equitable. And maybe that's something that I need to advocate for, or I need to factor into my master plan for whatever I'm building. You think, you see, oh, sorry, go ahead, KB. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, I, I, you know, I have a lot of friends that are developers, right? And they always look at, oh, I'm going to build a building. And the minute I get it, you know, the demand cycle of the space is really on the lease up front. And then once they kind of get it leased up and they have these 10 year leases, the asset value is purely driven by the cash flow it generates without really regard to is it is the is the space going up in demand? You know, they have escalating rent clauses and all mm-hmm. that. But a lot of times, you know, they don't know what 10 years looks like, but it's all purely based on this piece of paper, this this contractual. And that's the value of the property, whereas. Sometimes maybe it's a new, a more favorable space. So actually it's worth more seven years from now, or maybe it's gone bad. You know, the space has changed or whatever, and it's mm-hmm. worth less. Do you, do you think when you start moving into these short-term kind of the flexibility, people have to be a lot more astute to like where things are going, I would think. Yeah. That's what I was thinking as you were saying that. I mean, I, I think that the days of 10 year leases are, going to be limited. Uh, those aren't going to come around. That's not how you're going to fill up your building. And um, I think even today, you know, well, I guess it depends on the investment thesis that the developer or investor is looking for. You know, are you are you looking for somewhere that you're going to have this exponential um, ROI over time? And that's what you expect from the location that you chose. But um, there's a lot of dynamic shifting right now. And I think that's the really cool part about being able to use data to, to take that, um, what's, what am I thinking of? Like almost like a, a check on where, where is the neighborhood at this moment? Is this 
um, a, a time that I just need to start thinking about disposing of this asset, maybe before I had originally thought. And by being able to track all of those different pieces of the ecosystem that surrounds the asset, I think you're going to be able to make more informed decisions, which to your point, might need to happen on a more frequent basis than what the industry is used to considering, you know? Yeah. I think it's interesting too, you know, I've, I've had the good fortune of talking to a lot of the, the large tech companies when we start talking about distributed workforce hmm. and they're kind of looking at real estate as you know, their offices, as a place for people to kind of co-work hmm. and mapping out where all their employees live and where the talent is. So, you know, where talent lives is now the amenity it's maybe not the airport. It's maybe not the university. And one of the largest ones, they said, hey, can you do a, is there a way to do a study against where do all my employees live? Where, do this, where does the talent live? And then I'm going to rent something that is um, convenient to the clustering of my teams. Mm -hmm. So instead of forcing them into the office, it's just convenient. It's like going to your own private Starbucks. Uh, and, and we'll have great coffee and we'll have a great experience for them. And this whole idea of like, um, you know, your office as an experience kind of thing. Um, are you all starting to intersect into some of that other data, like the talent data? Um, absolutely. I think that we are looking to add more employment data to our data sets and to the insights that we're bringing. Right now, people are considering adding satellite offices. So it's not like they're taking even potentially less space, it's just smaller space, more distributed. And I think um, part of understanding where talent lives is also what amenities do they have access to where they, where they live. Um, part of bringing people together is also like, why should they go there? You know, yes, you are collaborating with your coworkers, but does the location add anything that makes you want to go there? Maybe you have access to different restaurants. If you are going in, you want to optimize the time you are spending together. But I think overall, understanding even the skill sets, I think the conversation around employment is getting more granular, where you're trying to understand actually where do people with specific skill sets live? And if I do have satellite offices there, am I going to be able to hire? Am I going to be able to create a network that's adding value? Even if it's people that don't work at my company, I think that's why co-working works so well, because you have the opportunity to start um, interacting with people that might bring something to what you're doing that's outside of the scope of your day-to-day -day work. It's just, it's um, finding those new skill sets and new perspectives that you might find just grabbing coffee or kombucha at the, yeah. at the bar in the co-working space. I, th I think it's, I think what the, the trends are fascinating. You know, if you look at large IT companies in India, they run campuses, they have corporate housing, they have schools. Some of them have K through 12. And I was talking to some uh, tech leaders and they said, you know, childcare is now an amenity more valuable than a microbrewery or a coffee shop. Like mm -hmm. people don't like as an employer, if you can say, Oh, here's all the opportunities for childcare in the area. Like that's a selling point more so than, Oh, there's a cool restaurant <laughs> for a certain, Absolutely. for a certain demographic. Right. Absolutely. So we have our daycare score. And I think that's like a perfect example of how the use of our insights has shifted even over the last few years where originally I think, that use case might've been more residential, but now you see these tenants saying no, to get people to come back to the office, I need to show that that's an, op that's an option nearby. And to your point for certain people, like that's even more important than being able to go out to lunch with your coworkers. Yeah. So we're, we're, I, I, I do want to talk about this a little bit more, mm -hmm. but we do have a, our, our second guest waiting in the wings, but before you go, mm -hmm. let's take a little trip to the future even further out, let's say 20, 25 years. This is a question I ask all of our guests. So 20, 25 years from now, and you could bring with you any gadget or service that just makes you personally happy or just in some way makes your life better, what would it be and what would it do? <laughs> well, I think um, like many of my colleagues at Local Logic, I'm a cities nerd and I would like to be able to just travel instantly and go to any city that I want uh, without having that, you know, 18 hour flight um, and potentially being able to bring my dog with me so we can go on some cool new adventures together. I think that'd be really fun. I love that idea. I, yeah. As someone who spends, you know, a better portion of my life on planes, I'm, I'm right there with you. Although I do like the travel part, but yeah, if we mm -hmm. can, 
make that instantaneous and just teleport. That would be amazing. It would be amazing. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we have a second guest uh, and KP, I'm going to let you introduce our, our second guest. Got uh, Cal Inman. Cal, are you there? <laughs> I, I'm really excited to have Cal. We recently partnered with Climate Check. Um, and so we're showing Climate Check's climate risk scores on our platform. Uh, we're making it available to our existing clients. And um, we didn't get into this yet, but I think just telling that story of climate risk is a really big part of understanding the environment around your location. So really excited to have Cal join the conversation. Very Excellent. Cool. Thanks for having me. Cal, so you you are a developer. You're also a lecturer at UC Berkeley. Uh, so before we dive into climate check, can you just give us uh, a little snapshot of, of your actually very illustrious career? <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it kind of goes to what we were talking about before. Uh, um, you know, this transition of entrepreneurship from maybe a, one industry into technology or data. Uh, so my background is commercial real estate uh, out of college. Well, for a while, I cleaned uh, sailboats in Long Beach. And then I decided probably get my life together. I was always really interested by the built environment, developers. My <laughs> father was a journalist. And so I spent the weekend just, you know, looking at new projects in the Bay Area. And it always intrigued me. Worked for a developer for five years. Uh, after cleaning sailboats and uh, then around 2009 went out on my own and did small urban infill projects around the Bay Area. So that's kind of uh, where my heart is in the built environment. Nice, nice. And ha so, so how did you like find Climate Check? How did they find you? What was the evolution of that? Yeah, um, you know, the yield started really dropping in these deals where self-funding them um, and it was hard to find and just make the numbers work on projects uh, and so I, I started doing some lecturing at UC Berkeley in the master's in real estate development program and uh, there I just came across look all these smart people in climatology that had uh, had been researching climate science for decades uh, and then this kind of spark happened I realized a bunch of the big LPs that I'd worked with in my uh, previous career for, for a developer in the very beginning, uh, we're using this climate data to inform their real estate decision-making. It just felt like a huge opportunity. I mean, look, I wanted to know as a small landlord, as a developer, what my property's risks were to climate change. Is there gonna be increased risk of flood? Uh, are my properties at increased risk of fire? You know, I think about that stuff when I was renewing my insurance policy. But the second I realized that folks on Wall Street are using this data, uh, it, it just, it seemed like, it seemed like there's a real asymmetry between, you know, the big dogs and really everyone else up to, you know, a few billion dollar uh, private equity funds, investors, lenders. There's just so many people not ingesting it all the way down to the homeowner. Uh, and so uh, we seized on that opportunity and it took a while. We built a team of climatologists, data scientists, and created a product. Spent the first two years really just creating a product uh, that was easy to search and easy to understand. So can you type in an address? And if you don't have a PhD in this stuff, can you understand what your property's risk is to climate change? Uh, and so, yeah, that's been the journey. It's been fun. That point I really like, and I'd like to talk to both of you about that, you know, data is leveraged by so many factions within companies now. And you have to deliver it in different ways based on the level of understanding and the level of sort of parsing data and the data points that are important to one group may be different. Uh, how, do you, how do you actually kind of service that and sort of be one size fits all where you can give data to data scientists who can kind of nerd out on it, but then you've got someone who just is, just tell me what my bottom line is. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, every group, every stakeholder invests, uh, ingests data differently. So I think the answer is flexibility. Uh, you need to be uh, 
it needs to be actionable and easy to understand. So someone like, you know, my mom who lives down the street as a homeowner with no background in real estate, no background in deep due diligence can look at it and get an inkling of what it means and dig in deeper and understand it, but also be able to feed, you know, deeper data sets to groups that have, you know, economists, data scientists, I think just flexibility in the data, but you have to start with kind of the lowest bar, which is the layman, right? Like me as the consumer, just a developer with no understanding of climate science. Uh, and so I think that's, that's the bar we start at. And I think that that helps everyone ingest the data. How do, how do you think, like we, we have this debate internally, um, you know, as a venture firm only focused on the built environment, we get to debate a lot. And just this, the whole nomenclature of ESG, that how ESG is like, what you're saying is you're going to track data is what you're signing up for. It doesn't necessarily say that you're going to do anything about it. It doesn't necessarily say that it has anything to do with like uh, climate impact, but it's just like, oh, we're, we'll just, we'll just track it. Right. It's like, I'm going to track my blood pressure. It doesn't mean I'm going to do anything to make it better necessarily, but I'm going to share it with you. And so we've been like really shifting away just because we think there's like an ESG whitewashing happening right now. And there's not enough people that actually want to understand like what, what the drivers are. So we've been doing these studies around geofencing a project and everything from like the construction waste all the way through occupancy, thinking about like if you geofence these little developments, what are their community net impact, right? To climate, especially like resilience. You know, you start talking about like these Florida markets where, you know, the, the ocean is now your backyard. <laughs> you thought you were next to the ocean that you're now in the ocean. Are you seeing people that like for you that where they're, they're much more focused on the actual impact or are you actually differentiating the ESG noise away from like the climate noise? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, it does feel like the wild west right now. I mean, there's all these things, you know, the E has so many components. The S is complex. Uh, the G, uh, you know, hard to track and quantify. So it, it's, it's interesting. And I'd say where we live in climate risk, and to be really clear, it's, we're saying for a particular property, a footprint, what is that footprint's risk to the impact from the impacts of climate change? So we look at natural hazards today, like flooding, how will that change over time with the changing environment? And so that world of climate risk, physical climate risk, uh, is, is one component of the E. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of other pieces to that. But one thing I'd say about the folks that we feed data to in commercial real estate, analytics, uh, whoever, lenders, pretty much anyone in the capital stack, uh, insurers, they're ingesting the data, not because uh, some pension fund is saying you need to be SG, check these boxes. Uh, folks are ingesting this data because like this is basic risk due diligence in the same way we look at underground storage tanks or uh, demand, um, uh, location, everything like this that, that we think about when we're looking at a new asset or we're kind of monitoring our portfolio. So uh, I do think it, it is part of the ESG, but um, it, yeah, time will tell how, how that whole world shakes out. I think there's a lot of good in there and there's good intent, but uh, it, it does feel like a lot of tracking. Yeah. Oh, yeah I think it's check the box if you want to check the box. Yeah. I mean, I think, and there was some data that came out this week that said, these ESG funds are actually not overperforming kind of the non-ESG funds that, that it's actually creating a bit of portfolio selection bias by trying to meet these ESG requirements. Um, and that what's, what's the net, the net impact. <laughs> like it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's not really going anywhere. So, I mean, I think it's really cool because I've looked at a lot of companies trying to do different things where you do have, you know, believe it or not, there are real estate developers that are trying to be good stewards of our planet <laughs> and of their communities. Um, they're not all evil empire, but um, I've just found that it's it's been really hard for them to do the right thing, right? It's because I'm sure what you're doing is very complicated. Yeah, I mean, uh, and especially in SG, it's like, it's not always, you know, you can't always just increase yield by, you know, making whatever the right decisions. Uh, and so uh, it's complex, you know, I mean, as a real estate developer, sometimes I want to build a cooler project or something more active to the community or 
more engaging for uh, the tenants, uh, but that doesn't always trickle directly into yield and IRR. So I mean, these are all the kind of, this is where the art of real estate comes in, I guess. But that's a smart point too, KP, because really we're not going to get, first of all, you know, we want to move, you know, ES, the notion of ESG from sort of compliance, something you have to do, and then out of a sort of a marketing strategy and into actually trying to, to create change from the inside out. But the, if the economics don't work, we're not going to get there. And I think that's kind of the piece that we need to crack. And I'm not asking you to solve the problem, Cal, but do you have some thoughts on, you know, instead of just mitigating risk, what are some of the things that, you know, are good for the planet that are good for the bottom line? Yeah. I mean, when we're talking about climate risk, I think the good for the planet part is as homeowners start to ingest this data, right? We're on every Redfin listing, for instance millions of people there are looking at climate risk data. I think that engages folks in the conversation. So there is something to be said about just data transparency, understanding it, being aware of it. And, and, and I think that does benefit the world kind of in a feel good way. But I think from a real commercial real estate perspective, your investor, your lender, I think reducing risk you know, trickles down to the bottom line in the end. Uh, it increases your IRR, a big thesis that folks that are ingesting this data have is we own, if we're going to own this asset for 10 years or seven to 10 years, like a, a, an investment fund or the average homeowner owns their home for six to seven years, the buyer of that asset or that home likely will be ingesting some climate risk data looking another 10 years out. So now all of a sudden a 20 year look is really important because if that buyer isn't saying, Hey, there's a big risk at the end of this kind of ownership cycle, they're going to discount the price appropriately. So that disposition price of a real estate asset is the biggest factor in your rate of return uh, to your fund. And so the, it, it, it trickles down. I mean, it goes right to the bottom line of these deals. So I think that's where, and I think that's why so many folks are ingesting climate risk data uh, outside of, uh, of groups that are required to do ESG reporting. Uh, and frankly, just becoming best practices within the equity part of the capital stack. And I think the lenders will, will follow quickly. I would just add to that, like, I, I think we've kind of talked about that there's value outside of ESG for the climate risk. When you think about the intensification of assets right now that's happening, you look at like repositioning shopping malls, for example, and um, rethinking, you know, parking lots and, and just adding more multifamily to these sites. A lot of times the way that we're currently thinking about measuring ESG actually um, dings those kinds of projects because you're looking at all this embodied carbon and like your material choices. But I think that where we're going at Local Logic is trying to also understand like how that impacts behavior and are you actually going to be like lessening the number of car trips because you're going to have more people with more access to the things they need? And so I think kind of where Cal is also going, it's like, it's also at the consumer level. I think people are going to start to care more about climate risk, about their personal um, ESG and, and emissions impacts on the world. And so maybe it will be like trickling up as well, this demand for this kind of information. It's, it's really interesting, you know, like, uh, you know, Cal, like relating it to underground storage tanks or whatever. I started my, like, as a civil, I started my career as a civil engineer. So did phase ones and phase, like did all the stuff that you're talking about. And I had the good fortune of working with some great developers that had a long view. And I had some not so great developers that were just like, KP, get it done as, as cheap as possible. Um, we're going to flip this thing as soon as it's leased up. We don't really care. And I think to your point, the asset buyers today, they care about that. Like they want to know that they're buying, like to your point about the asset appreciation for, for to disposition, these are all data points that are like vectors in that, in that decision these days that maybe when I was practicing as a civil engineer 25 years ago, nobody cared about. And it was, you know, just like, let's just make sure there's no tanks and remediate, you know, it was like that kind of idea. Yeah. Um, I think that's super interesting. I mean, it's the uh, one of the best analogies. I mean, there's been all these 
uh, waves of data within real estate. Uh, but underground storage tanks is one of the best. I mean, in the 90s, some folks said, hey, we're just going to investigate this. And there was no standard lender requirements, right? Um, and then ASTM created a framework and a standard that said, here's what it, here's how you do environmental due diligence. You know, there's a phase one, we do this physical investigation uh, based on data. And then if, if we find something deeper, we need to drill a hole in the ground. And now we have this process that we all do every time we buy a property, refinance a property. And we're seeing this, this data risk set, climate risk going through a, a very similar, um, you know, uh, path. Uh, so we're part of the ASTM uh, committee and anyone can join, but we're seeing a lot of the environmental consultants, probably some of your old compatriots, uh, creating a framework around climate risk and how do we ingest it? How do we screen a portfolio of properties? Uh, how do we do look at it from a desktop? How do we get boots on the ground? Uh, and then most importantly, like, you know, what's actionable from this? How do we mitigate these risks for this property? Uh, and so, yeah, that I think that analogy uh, for underground storage tanks, phase ones is, is perfect. Because now it's just ubiquitous, right? We all do it. No, everybody just knows. Like people don't even know what it is, but they know what, like they don't know actually what, as an engineer, you go out and do. They just know it's part of a checkbox, right? Get a phase one, you know, get a title. It's just one of those checkbox items that's kind of ingrained in the process. So, I, no, I think that's super. I and mean, we could talk probably for two hours and bore everybody else. But um, I mean, I think like when you start looking at ASTM standards and, you know, there is some, you know, there, there's definitely a compliance part of our industry to get civil and, you know, the civil and environmental engineers and the urban planners on board. You know, they don't want to lose a deal because they offered something that's maybe right and extra when the other firm lowballs them by doing the bare minimum. And, and it's very hard for them to communicate the value. So the best way to do that is through you know, standards. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, pr the practitioners, like you said, there's different actors, right? Some people want the best due diligence. Some people just want to get the deal done and, uh, and you get kind of different levels of consultants and different levels of data. Uh, but I think people ingesting it is, it, I mean, it's, it's, there's been a big progression here. Uh, that's very similar to that market. It's, it's fun to watch. It's fun to be a part of. Very cool. Do you think, I mean, you're, you're working with, you know, some, some bright young minds regularly at UC Berkeley. Do you think that the fact that those bright young minds are going to be the workforce of the future, the founders of the future, do you, do you think that, that actually the, it's, it's their will, they're caring about the environment, they're growing up with, you know, these types of issues sort of top of mind, you know, do you see that as, as actually, Again, you know, I think it, the key is the is the proactive um, movement, you know, towards not just mitigating risk, but really changing the way we do things. But but do, where do you see that that line and, and that impact of the next generation? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, look, the youth is the future. I like being around younger folks just because I I find it invigorating. You know, they're not so cynical. I mean, the youths. <laughs> The kids uh, exactly beaten down um i'll tell you what i mean this might not be so deep but when folks do even big big funds right reads uh big private equity groups i mean they're still on excel and uh i thought i was kind of an outlier you know even just doing little performers on a piece of paper um and just digging into the kind of the prop tech world it, the the industry is very old school uh, and everyone kind of does what works, right? There's a lot of picking up the phone. There's not a lot of tech in the process. And I think, you know, uh, and we've talked a lot about a lot of the solutions, but I just think the market opportunity is so big. And I'll, I'll tell you why I think it's gonna be adopted is because, you know, the students in these classes are just flabbergasted by, by uh, how, you know, how there's no real technology to help any of these processes. And they're like, they're going to be the next generation of developers, right? They're going to start as assistant project managers and they're going to work their way up and run firms. And they're eager to get their hands on technology to make their jobs easier. I mean, they grew up on, on computers, cell phones. And so I think uh, time's right for everything uh, you all are doing uh, kind of in the, in the general prop tech space. Yeah. 
It's really interesting. So I, I teach, uh, I got, I, I teach at Georgia tech. And um, one of the reasons I teach it's like, it's not for the money. Um, you quickly learn that these kids, you know, they're in four years, they're going to come work for you. And in five years, in 10 years, there might be decision makers. So I'm trying to like, you know, get them to drink the Kool-Aid early, you know, <laughs> like by being their professor, you get a bad grade if you don't drink the Kool-Aid, but it's such a point, you know, their view of technology, it's just very point and click, like show me the tool where I can put the data in and click versus trying to create some MATLAB simulation. Like they don't, they're, they're not really builders of tech. They just assume that if it's important, tech exists and I can point and shoot. Yeah. And, and we don't have a lot of that. So I think it's, yeah. it's, I mean, there's an interest in it. It's just that if I can't click on something, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I and mean, they're ready for it. You know, it needs to be easy. It needs to be as easy as, uh, you know, their Gmail account and uh, their TikTok account and everything like that. Uh, but they're also used to ingesting a lot of data, like from our world as producing data. They're used to ingesting so much more data in, around decision making than, than, you know, I was when I was starting off. Uh, and so I think uh, I think we'll see a, a, a lot of progression within the industry. Uh uh, just a lot of opportunity. Yeah, a little side note on that too. They're also really good about sharing data with each other. Whereas like when I was in the business, like you never talked to your competitor and God forbid, you never would share a spreadsheet. Like you would never do that. Like you'd get in trouble. These folks, they just share everything. It's like, hey, you know, that's proprietary. They're like, yeah, but like, isn't it good if everyone has it? And you're like, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> like maybe. <laughs> I think it's good. I, I actually do. I think, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, of course I'm a you know big believer in the, you know, the rising tide analogy. Um, and, and, you know, especially with emerging technology and, you know, and it's amazing. We've had this conversation. We haven't really even talked about deep tech and, and emerging tech and, you know, how AI and blockchain and all these things are going to figure into it because we're not there yet, but they, I think they're all going to be impactful in, in how we do things and, and how we make decisions. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, that uh, especially the two of you, actually, I'm going to give a lecture next week on immersive technology at UC Berkeley. So I'm glad we're out there, you know, giving, giving hopefully some nuggets of wisdom that inspire this next generation, because um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a, uh, it's an interesting time and I, and I do see the shift coming. It's just, I, I guess the, the question is when and, and how. Yeah. Soon and with a lot of smart minds. Good, good. Well, that's what, that's what we want. We need some smart minds out there, but in, in continuing in, in our future vein, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked Sarah and that I ask everyone. And it's much more of a, a personal vision uh, so if you could project yourself 20, 25 years into the future, and you could really just have, you know, any kind of service or gadget that just made you happy or made your life better, what would it be? And what would it do? Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe a, a hover chair, uh, just kind of float around the house, do Zoom wherever you want, somehow it incorporates with the bathroom and can take you outside, just make life easy. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> like a, a personal drone chair. Yeah, kind of. I don't know how it floats, but it does. well, it doesn't wait. See, that's the that's the point of the exercise. We don't have to solve it. We just need to put the ideas out there. Someone will solve it. Someone will go, wait a minute. You it's could like actually do boy. this. Yeah. <laughs> I know I how it know. feels. I know I don't know how it works. I don't know about your assumption that we'll still be on Zoom in 2050. That's that's a little troubling. <laughs> that is very troubling. Yeah. But I don't know that we're going to be in the metaverse either, as yeah. some people would have us believe. So I think it's going to be a, an interesting blend of how we parse data. But that's a whole other show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I'm pretty convinced with Zoom we've reached singularity. So I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I am at one with my microphone now, even though it keeps falling out of my ears. So I'm at like, I'm at, I'm at like 0.75 singularity with my headset. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a really, really interesting conversation. I think we could go for about two more hours, but, uh, but it was great insights. And thank you both for joining us today. And KP, as always, a pleasure. Good to see you, Amy. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks so much. It was fun. All right. Thanks, y'all.